Hey, good morning. Glad you're with us this morning. I, I want to talk to you about our role in prayer and how important that really uh, becomes in our life. That uh, I think that for a lot of Christians, uh, we might not understand um, how we do shape history, how we use um, terms like God's in control. It doesn't matter. Everything's going to work out. Um, trust God. And we use these things. They're not bad things in and of themselves at all. It's just that, what does that mean? How do we go about that? Why is it that um, things don't always go our way? <laughs> um, why don't more things go our way? Is it that God is uh, against us? Is it that God is somehow punishing us? And so why... Why is it important for us to talk about this and understand our role, understanding your role, my role, not as, you know, as a fivefold minister, not only for me, but um, as an everyday believer. Here's what a couple of things you have to understand. The moment you said yes to Jesus, the moment you did that, you were enlisted in an army and you became a target to the enemy. Whether you know you're in a war doesn't matter. Whether you know you're in a battle doesn't matter. And um, I think that a lot of Christians think, uh, don't understand that. Um, and I want you to, I want you to really really understand your role, um, how uh, you can actually help to shape history. And the reason why um, I stay so involved in understanding what's going on in the world, understanding what's going on politically, what's going on uh, governmentally, what's going on in the entertainment industry. This I keep posting stuff, stuff about the sex trafficking, the pedophile network, and the satanic network of Hollywood, the elites. It it's involves royal families. It it's involves a lot, a lot of people. Epstein Island, uh, Zuckerberg, and Schumer, and um, uh, Tom Hanks. All these people went to pedophile, Ben Affleck went to Pedophile Island. Um, and why, why is that important? Why is it really important for us to know all things? Because we need to know that, what to pray for. To, you know, maybe not, we don't know how to pray sometimes, right? That is true. Sometimes we don't know how to pray. But scripture never gives prayer an option. Scripture never sits there and says, uh, prayer is for the intercessor. Matter of fact, the Bible calls every Christian an intercessor. It doesn't sit there. There is no such calling as an intercessor. Intercessor. That is not a calling. That is a job assignment of every believer. And now some people might only feel that they're to intercede. They might not be called to preach and, uh, you know, uh, go and travel the world. But every Christian... Every single one of us is called to our knees. Every single one of us has to pray. Every single one of us has to come to the, before the throne. And I, I want to tell you something. I want to show you something in the book of Esther where sometimes we think, well, it's I, I got a good life. It's not going to affect me. I don't have to worry about these things. And this and this was Esther's belief. This was almost like Esther's like, what can I do with this? And you notice she called everybody to prayer. We're going to go through this scripture in a little bit. And I want to tell you that it's time. This is why pastors should tell their church what to pray for. And I will admit, I, I will tell you there are times when I don't know how to pray for that matter. That's where I at least have to come to my knees. I at least have to have passion to see God change my uh, environment, my culture around me, and Him to intercede. We are co-laborers with Christ, and where we do a lot of our laboring is going to be on our knees. And what happens to a lot of people is I think they don't think their prayers matter in the big scope of things. I, I want to change that perception. I want us to change our perception of does God use us in shaping 
America, the world. And I want to tell you, he not only uses you, he not only wants you, he actually won't do anything unless his people pray, unless his people intercede. It's when you see evil rise, my attitude with evil rising is, you know, the church has to know how to push back. First, look, you hear me say this. This is what the Lord spoke to me a week ago. Let me let me quote it word for word, because uh, sometimes I I, um, I I get so much stuff. Here's what he said to me, word for word. What you don't resist now, your children will tolerate. Your grandchildren will worship. And another, and so how do we push back? Do we go to the streets and fight? No, I'm not talking about pushing out. Even though, let me just say this. There is a civil war on our, on our horizon in America. I love to tell you it's not going to happen. But I have a really deep concern. Since 05, I saw this in the spirit coming. I've been talking about it for years, that there is a civil war coming to America. And I would say, did America ever think that we would have gay marriage? By the way, there is no such thing biblically. Let me explain something. Biblically, there is no such thing as gay marriage, biblically. Here's why. A marriage, the marriage, a marriage is defined by God. Marriage is something God gave us. It's a, it's a sacred thing that God gave in the creation of man and woman. And God has defined marriage in his word, and Jesus quoted it. That marriage is defined as a between a man and a woman only. That is the definition of marriage. You cannot have marriage between two males. You cannot have marriage between two females. By the way, you can't have marriage between three people. You know what? David had multiple wives. Yeah, but his marriage was one to another. The marriage wasn't all three of them. It was one to another. Boy, and just let me tell you, if that didn't create a whole bunch of problems uh, in David's life, he wasn't supposed to multiply. He didn't do it as bad as his son did. His son multiplied, multiplied, multiplied wives, and that was illegal. It was, you go, why was there, um, why did they were allowed to do that? There's a, that's a whole different study, but it was to keep the lineage of Israel going. He, God wanted to grow the Israelites, and he didn't want them to have to go outside, uh, the women to go outside to look for a man. So if a brother died, uh, uh, the, without children, then he was supposed to take her in as his wife also and bear children for his brother to keep the lineage going to grow Israel, to make him a numerous people. All right, so let's look in the book of Esther. And you know the story. You know the horrific things have now been schemed against Israel. I want to tell you, there are horrific things schemed against America. They've been at work for over 200 years. And, you know, um, I, I normally do it on my TikTok page. I talk, I do like little blurps of the truth about our Constitution. Um, but there was a battle from the beginning, a battle from the beginning go about slavery. You know, people will tell you Jefferson had slaves. He did. Tried to release them twice, but Virginia law forbid him to release the slaves. He could not actually release them in the state of Virginia. And when he became president, he actually wrote a law. It was passed, I think, in 1807. And then the Democrats in 1820 uh, repealed the law. This is why this is why Lincoln knew. And by the way, 1854, they started the Republican Abolishment Party to get rid of slavery. It was started in 1854. And that was its purpose. And, and Lincoln knew that even though he emancipated him for War Powers Act, he knew he needed a constitutional amendment to do it. All right. This is a really interesting part of scripture. And here's the dilemma. Uh, um, Haman hates the Jews, hates Mordecai, hates the Jews. He hates that they're in, you got to understand, uh, this is in Medes, Persia, in, in their reign. So this is after Babylon. They have come in. They've taken over Babylon. Here is Esther, Mordecai, and Haman cannot stand them. 
And what he doesn't know is that Esther is a Jew. And that, and that she gains this great favor with the king. He takes her in as her queen. But now she's got a problem. They find out that Haman has made this um, um, horrendous uh, decree to kill all the Jews and to hang them on the gallows. Verse 13, And Mordecai told them to Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Let me tell you something. Do not think that if we do not begin to pray, that somehow as Americans or as Christians, we are not going to find the same fate as other nations when they have come against Christians, they've come against freedom. Do not think that you will escape this through atrophy, through, um, through um, slothfulness and not being diligent in prayer. You will not escape this. That is the word of the Lord. You will not escape this by hiding your head in the sand. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish, yet you knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I want to tell you something. I believe everybody thought that George W. Bush, a confessed Christian, was going to defend our country. He did from the foes from without, but he did not from the foes within. His greatest failure as a president was he allowed the marching tides against the American freedoms to continue. He allowed them. <clears throat> okay? So... A God rose up another deliverer. And I believe his name is Donald Trump. I do believe God gave Donald Trump to us. I believe God had to find someone outside of the church to defend the church because the church did not believe in defending the church. Donald Trump has done more to defend freedoms than, than maybe even than Ronald Reagan. But Ronald Reagan is the last president I can tell you that ever stood against the tyranny the way that Trump does. Now listen, then Esther told the re this re them to reply to Mordecai, listen, go gather all the Jews who present them as Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Let me tell you something. I believe, and I'm going to talk to other leaders, and I think it's time to call our nation to a three-day fasting and prayer. I believe it is time to call ourselves to a time of fasting and prayer for the president. Not just prayer. A three-day demarcation of fasting and prayer for the president. Why? Because you have to you have to understand, God is at the ready. The angels are at the ready. They're waiting for God's people to do what God's people are to do, which is to pray and to mobilize them. We don't need another party. We don't need, um, we need to understand that without prayer, Without prayer, it would appear that God is not involved when the truth of the matter is, without prayer, we are the ones who are not involved with God. We are the ones who are not doing our job. And I, it would be great if you fast here, fast here. I'm going to tell you, I think it's time to call the nation to a three-day fasting and prayer event. Okay? And I do not listen to me. I'm going to give some. I'm going to call some of my friends. And I do not think that we can wait until the election. Why? Because by the time the election comes, it's going to be too late. Absentee ballots, mail ballots, everything they're trying to do. I think it's going to be too late. Listen. Go gather all the Jews. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, 
which is against the law. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Now, if it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes, this is her robes of dominion. This is the robes that the king himself gave. I'm going to give you strategy here. And the king held out Esther the golden scepter. Look at, let me just tell you something. It's time for us to fast and pray. And on the third day, put on our royal robes. Put on the Holy Ghost. And go into the courtroom before the great king. And go in there. We will have favor upon favor and worship him. And when we do that, he will intercede on our behalf. And he will end it in this nation. He will end the tyranny. He will end the wickedness. He will expose those that are doing wicked in closed doors. He will expose the pedophiles, the sex traffickers, the communists, the Marxists, the murderers, the anarchists. He will expose them and he will deal with them. But he will not deal with them until we pray. You can't just go, well, God will do it, and walk away. You have to spend time. You have to clear your schedule. You have to make time for God in this. And it's too inconvenient for the modern Christian. That's the problem. It's too inconvenient for the modern Christian to do that. It's too inconvenient to fast and to pray and to put our face before God. It is our role in prayer. It is how we co-labor with God in prayer, by fasting and praying, by seeking his face, by going after him and crying out. We might not know what to say, but we have to know why we're going in. We have to know what, what is our purpose in going in. Why are we fasting and praying? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? What is the purpose for us fasting and praying? We have to know why in going in. And when we go in, we can pray in tongues. We can pray and worship. And he will know why we came in. And he will bend his ear to us. And he will incline his ear to the righteous prayers of the saints. And he will deliver this nation. He will set this nation back on its right course to all men are created equal, to all men are called to worship him, to all men and women. But it will take us desiring to do something about it on our knees. On our knees. This is my call. This is my call. I hope you heard me today. That we are called to pray, to fast, to go after God with all our heart, with all our might, with all our strength. It's, it's really tough to just take that moment and pray. It's really tough. We're so used to 30-second videos, we think we can pray a simple prayer, God hears us. And it doesn't work that way for the big stuff, folks. It doesn't work. we got to stop deceiving ourselves to think and we can just go, oh, Lord, thank you, oh, and move on. And God heard my prayer. If it's not passionate to you, if you have no passion, if you have nothing that drives you, if there's nothing that compels you in prayer, do not think that you're just saying a nice pet prayer is going to move the heart of God because it's not moving your heart. If it doesn't move your heart, it's not going to move his heart. That's my... That's my, that's my teaching for the day. I hope you hear me. I hope you hear me. And you'll stay tuned to what's coming as we call the nation to prayer. I love you guys, and I'll talk to you later.